Good. Well, let me uh, start right away. Uh, sure, most of you will have seen some of my projections at previous meetings, but I ordered them a little bit differently to make my today's presentation. What you see here is that about 150 years ago, genetics, evolutionary biology, as well as nucleic acid biochemistry started by uh, essential uh, in kind of considerations of variant organism. Variant means phenotype, variant phenotypes. From the same species, there are a number of different phenotypes. And genetics for a long time did not know where uh, that there is genetic information and where that might be stocked. Uh, therefore, uh, the advance considering largely uh, higher animals, higher plants, uh, did not progress very rapidly. Until in the 1940s, microbiology started to do genetics also. They had seen that there are phenotypic variants in their bacterial strains, and they could see that there is some exchange uh, of genetic information in the world of microorganism. And that led uh, Avery and his colleagues in 1944 to clearly show that uh, genetic information exists and it is stored in DNA molecules. That notion was not widely accepted by life scientists because they felt genetic information must be something very complex, uh, probably at least proteins, which is composed of uh, about 20 different amino acids, whereas uh, the nucleic acid has only four letters in the alphabet. Uh, then, fortunately, structure biology brought some help. Watson and Crick, using a, a, a methods becoming available, could show that DNA are, uh, um, are uh, double-stranded, uh, complementary uh, linear molecules of large sizes, and bacterial genetics showed at the same time uh, by uh, their crossing from one strain to another that particular genes uh, giving some particular phenotypes would be transferred in a linear fashion uh, so that it became obvious that the E. coli bacteria with which this work has been done uh, is indeed just one single double-stranded circular molecule. Symbolically, uh, I show here the double-strandedness with AT and GC pairs, and a little bit not in the right scale, I put one gene. Gene is composed of the essential information uh, for making a gene product, mostly proteins, and uh, also uh, uh, other sequences which are at different locations which control the expression of this particular gene. The, uh, genome here, as you can see, is the order of almost five million base pairs. And of course, we are aware that higher organisms have much larger genomes with several, uh, a certain number of chromosomes uh, of independent replication. I would like uh, to show you just one example of the thoughts that Watson and Crick also had. They presented not in their uh, nature papers, but later in 1953 in the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium that uh, base pairing, how base pairing 
uh, is affected by the uh, conformational structure of uh, nucleotides. You see on the top line in the left, the normal base pair structure between adenine and thymine, uh, whereas on the right side, you can see that one of the hydrogen atoms uh, is not at this normal location, but down uh, at another uh, location, and that is called a short living, it's actually short living, less than one second, and it goes back to standard. But in this short period, uh, that is well known from organic chemistry that many molecules show these capacities of uh, isomeric short living structures. And they say that we have to be aware that in this isomeric form, also called totomers, uh, base pairing is not occurring uh, f f with, uh, in the normal way with thymine, but with cytosine from adenine. And they say, well, one has to be aware that this is a, a possibility to obtain some local mutagenesis. In fact, we know nowadays, so f uh, for all organisms <coughs> studied so far, they have repair systems to very rapidly look behind the replication fork whether that has happened during the replication. And uh, most of the uh, mispairings which would be uh, resulting from that uh, other correct pairing, it's not an error, uh, would be, of course, mutations, local mutations, substitutions. And fortunately, nature is, has in the long period of past evolution adapted these repair systems such that they are not fully 100% working, but to a, a, a very small fraction of uh, problems of these mispairings are left over and are uh, nucleotide substitutions. So this is, to my mind, not a, a, a error in the DNA replication, but nature uses uh, structural flexibility of these biological molecules in order to do something uh, to drive on evolution. Um, sorry, no. It, Scientists relatively rapidly reached a consensus that by far not all novel mutations are actually beneficial. It's a considerable number of them, but less than, certainly less than half. More frequently are unfavorable mutations and uh, many such type of local mutations and other type of mutations are actually neutral because they do not affect particularly important genes. There are some segments which uh, can tolerate such changes. The um, scheme which I show you here, this is uh, kind of summarizing what uh, today's knowledge is. We have on the top, uh, you have on the left side a novel mutation, which is genetic variation, and this drives actually evolution. It's important. Without having occasional alterations in the nucleotide sequences, there wouldn't be any evolution possible. Uh, the direction of evolution is given by the, so what we call natural selection. Natural selection means uh, conditions of the environment in which uh, life is easy and possible and favorable. Uh, and this is due to physical chemical composition on the one hand and the presence of uh, other living beings in the same ecosystem. And they mutually influence each other, of course. And we have to be aware that another limitation of uh, 
possibilities is the uh, carrying capacity of our planet, which is stable because the planet doesn't grow. Uh, we cannot have more cells than we have nowadays. Uh, then, uh, the, of course, Charles Darwin and others worked with the isolation, and in higher organism, of course, not any living being can reproduce with any other living being. This is the reproductive isolation, and that modulates the process of evolution. In, on the lower part, on the left side, I uh, mentioned we know just working from E. coli on a few other microorganisms, and uh, we do know that there's a no, a considerable number of very specific mechanisms contributing to spontaneous mutagenesis. Uh, uh, I noticed there uh, without giving uh, examples, but on the left, extreme left side, I kind of summarize them into natural strategies of genetic variation. The, the local ones I already mentioned, this is very local. One or a few adjacent nucleotides can uh, undergo a change. The other is that intragenomic, uh, within that E. coli genome, uh, a segment can be deleted, a segment can be amplified, duplicated, and later on higher amplified, a segment can transpo transpose to another site, and the segment can that also, uh, all of these processes are enzymatically guided. Another, a segment can be in, uh, uh, returned and then gives novel type of fusions. So we know that very well, and the uh, eukaryotic geneticists for a long time claimed that this concerns only microorganisms, it doesn't concern them. The problem which I see is that uh, these are rare events and it is difficult in higher organisms to s detect rapidly such c uh, events. E. coli bacteria have a generation time of 30 minutes. We have a generation time most animals of several decades, so it's not so easy uh, to, and nature is very careful to rem leave per generation the big majority of uh, genomes unaffected uh, and undergoing evolutionary steps only with single uh, org organisms which then in uh, often are disfavored, they just disappear away, but if it's a favorable mutation, it helps. We have learned a lot in microbiology uh, with antibiotic resistances and then rather rapidly expanded that notion to any gene which is uh, carried uh, in the bacterial world. Uh, I show you here that the three strategies uh, are, uh, have different qualities in their contribution <coughs> to the uh, genetic information. I give there a few examples, but I just wanted to summarize, uh, yeah, to summarize that in fact, uh, the local one is uh, working on already existing functions and if uh, such a change to, in an existing function gives some improvement. Of course, natural selection helps that at long term that mut mutant can overgrow the parental population and what are other uh, organisms which are there. The DNA rearrangement internally is nothing new to be added, but as I already mentioned, new novel fusions can occur and sometimes we do know that important genes which an organism carries has, uh, is composed of functional domains and some of these functional domains are part of different genes and by fusing uh, more or less randomly uh, uh, genetic information, all of a sudden you may have the right configuration 
and that helps for natural selection. The third strategy is very efficient. If I mentioned that with antibiotic resistances, but it's true for all uh, markers, if you can acquire something which another organism in long evolutionary path has developed, you just take it over, uh, then uh, it can, can function. Interestingly, we do know since quite some time that all living beings use the same genetic language, the same universal genetic code, and therefore it is possible if you receive genetic information from one, from another organism, uh, if it helps your life, you can use it, you can uh, uh, benefit from that transfer. Here, uh, I made some conclusions now. Uh, we can conclude that, in fact, uh, there are, we do know that many of these processes are enzyme mediated, uh, and some are actually call them variation generators, and others are modulators of the frequency of uh, variation. Uh, we had worked uh, on uh, restriction modification and of course in the bacterial world this is very widespread and it is an interesting control uh, to detect incoming DNA whether this is foreign origin or not foreign and if it's foreign it's cut into fragments. Later on these fragments by other enzymes are uh, digested completely, but in the meantime, sometimes a fragment succeeds to incorporate into the genome of the recipient, and if that is beneficial, it helps its life and it's selected for. Uh, but as I mentioned with the example of uh, isomeric nucleotides, uh, nature is also clever enough to use structural flexibilities, other uh, non-genetic elements like, uh, for example, random encounter that the virus carrying genes from one bacterium to another one, uh, the infection is more or less random and uh, that helps this non-genetic uh, element and, uh, of course, uh, environmental impacts and so on. Uh, so we conclude here that uh, natural reality uh, takes, uh, natural reality is actually actively contributing to the process of biological evolution. This is important and even today we have not succeeded to convince a majority of life scientists to uh, reach a consensus uh, on these conclusions. It's very hard because uh, if a scientist has worked uh, efficiently in, with the old fashioned ways and uh, it comes, it's confronted with something which is not con uh, yet entered the textbooks, uh, you have a hard time to, to uh, convince them that they say, yeah, you, you may be right. Um, I will uh, show you here, uh, for time reason, I abstain from, <coughs> from showing lots of uh, supporting data, but I show you just one quite interesting, I'm proud of that experiment. What you see here is uh, an E. coli cell with the chromosome on the left side and another circular molecule. This is the provirus uh, of a lysogenic, P1 lysogenic, cell. Bacteriophage P1 does not integrate in the lysogenic state in the chromosome as some other viruses do, but it is replicated as a uh, plasmid uh, in really once, it replicates once per, uh, uh, per generation of, of these bacterial cells. And we have grown this uh, th th this uh, bacteriophage P1 genome has about 50 important genes uh, which are distributed on that plasmid. 
and we have grown it uh, during three months. Every day diluting it in the morning and let it grow to uh, saturation, next morning dilute again and so on, without any, just under normal growth conditions. And then we can look whether a virus uh, is still able to produce upon UV radiation uh, viruses. This is what we call induction of growth of uh, lysogenic bacteria, uh, of, of, of growth of bacterial phage. And very relatively few cells in this lo long grown culture were not able to produce viruses, although the cells normally lysed. Uh, we then uh, took uh, in the non-induced cell the plasmid out, purified it, and looked what kind of mutation has occurred. And as I uh, show you here, a majority of these little muta mutants carried a transposable element from the genome. The bacterial genome has a number of different uh, IS elements, uh, insertion sequence elements, uh, which can translocate from one side to another, um, and that has happened sometimes. Of course, there are other possibilities of mutagenesis, except this is a lab experiment. Uh, horizontal gene transfer uh, between two uh, gene accepting a gene from another type of organism is not possible in this experiment. But uh, internal translocation and local mutagenesis. And the interesting thing was that 95% uh, of all individual uh, isolated mutants were due to translocation of uh, transposable element from the genome. Uh, uh, only 5% were local mutants. You see, uh, it's not so easy to see how these three strategies, uh, which is the, the efficiency of the three strategies to contribute to uh, uh, normal localization. Here you see in top the uh, whole uh, plasmid stretched out linearly and each dot shows uh, the location of one of these uh, mutants uh, which are not producing a progeny phage. Uh, you see there is a hot region there uh, with lots of dots. There are other regions which have uh, fewer dots and uh, some region where we know that there are essential genes are none. So uh, transposing elements have some preference to go either to particular sites as IS-30. All the three different isolates were at precisely the same sites, two in one orientation and one in the other orientation. While IS-2 is, was the most frequently seen, it has a preferred region, but each location that you see on the bottom uh, uh, integrated at different sites and these sites were sequenced and there is no homology between these sequences. So each of these elements has another strategy to uh, select their insertion site. The blue ones are uh, a number of other elements from the same cell. There are, uh, these are three different IS elements which are not identified specifically. So, you see, uh, of course, these are, this is it's very difficult if you think about looking for the source of uh, lethal mutagenesis. Uh, th because lethal mutagenesis means that you cannot grow the organism any longer. But here it is possible under these particular conditions. Uh, here I give uh, another. Uh, <coughs> implication, mainly that, in fact, we conclude that the, where are the genes, which I call evolution genes, which are variation generators and modulators of the frequency of genetic variation. They cannot, they, they must be in the genome. So the genome has a duality. 
And we know that this is not only true for microorganisms, it is true for all living beings. Uh, we also carry some genes uh, which are uh, implicated for evolutionary processes, whereas, uh, of course, a majority of all genes are to the benefit of the individual. Uh, and, oh, oh, I'm sorry, oh, this is, uh, yeah, it goes a bit fast, that, no. I, I lost one of the projections, I'm sorry for that. Uh, but I, I come back to, to uh, conclude here. This is uh, just in the bacterial world, just to show you, I think you have seen that before at one time, that viruses are, can, be ca can be considered as natural gene vectors and they do so occasionally. But uh, then the... Uh, restriction modification systems which I mentioned and a number of other uh, conditions uh, are actually limiting very heavily the acquisition process. So the strategy of acquisition in small steps is what nature do, does. And in order to make the link to, uh, in other occasions I then showed you that uh, nature, these natural processes uh, are actually the stimulators of genetic engineering. Uh, you are successful if you take a relatively small segment of genetic information, one or a very few genes, otherwise the harmony is not given. Uh, because if you think uh, you take a half a genome of one organism and a half a genome of the other, uh, you will not have uh, a viable uh, organism. And this is my last uh, contribution. Natural uh, evolution uh, was already uh, concluded by Charles Darwin that th today's living organisms on the top uh, have common roots. He doesn't say, and we do not yet know whether there is one origin of life on, on the planet Earth or many different origins of life, but this is symbolically showing the blue part is Darwin's uh, conclusion, and we do see today that this is absolutely correct, but in addition, you have horizontal connections to be made, used just once, more or less randomly, and through which only a small part of genetic information can be transferred horizontally. And if that helps you, uh, you uh, can uh, overgrow the other population at long term. Uh, a conclusion from that, we have, it's correct that we have common roots, but we also have, if you think on future evolution of these today's organisms, future, uh, uh, we have common future. We can profit in any evolutionary step from horizontal transfer from another branch of the tree. And that is for me an additional reason, uh, not only for beauty reasons, uh, that the, we have to be very careful not to uh, lose the big richness of biodiversity on our planet because that would be catastrophic. Thank you for your attention.